we continue the story about the future of Messianic Israel with a wedding being held on the shores of the previously dead sea, but what is now called Yam Chayim, the lake of life, as was prophesied by Ezekiel and Zechariah. Hi, my name is Eric and I investigate all things biblical. I also wrote this faith fictional story based on every little detail I could find in the Bible regarding the future Israel in the days of King Messiah. Let's go. A lesson from Isaiah's marriage. The wedding was to be held in the new messianic tradition under a wedding canopy or chuppah on the beautiful manicured lawns beneath palm trees. We were seated on white garden chairs waiting with a groom on the arrival of the bride. He's an engineer at a startup research company, my Korean friend David said, nodding in the groom's direction. He's so privileged to work with the world's sharpest minds, Sunny contributed, very proud of her nephew. Yes, it's God's blessing that's making Israel the most innovative of all nations, I remarked. Amen, they agreed, just as we heard that the bride has arrived. Soon her uncle walked her down to the chupa and handed her to the groom for the official part of the ceremony to start. The bride had a beautiful full-bodied wedding gown with a long veil held to her head with a crown of flowers and pearls. The groom looked dashing too, wearing a cream suit with an open-necked white shirt. Nobody wears black, for Israel is definitely no more in mourning. The pastor introduced the couple and after a brief prayer, the cantor sang the beautiful words of Hosea too, with a deep bass voice. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in justice and in righteousness and in loving kindness and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you shall know Jehovah. These are the words Jewish men have recited for three millennia whenever they wrap the phylacteries around their right arms to daven to pray. With powerful simplicity, the pastor then got right into his message with a focus on the spiritual aspect of the lifelong covenant the couple was entering. Using a Korean translator, he started by reading from Isaiah 3 verse 1. Then Jehovah said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of Jehovah for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. The word adultery is usually not mentioned at weddings, but we were all very familiar with the verse because it links the divine restoration of virgin Israel to the ultimate consumption of the bride and the bridegroom in the age to come. It foretells of the resurrection rapture, the day when we all, both the living and the dead, will eventually see the Almighty in all His splendor, when we will come into His presence and not die, because we would have been transformed like the 144,000 resurrected saints who serve as living proof of the hope we have in King Yeshua, our pathfinder to life, the beloved whose name is above all names. Next, the pastor got into the beautiful words of Hosea too. And it shall be in that day, says Jehovah, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master, for I will take from her mouth the names of the Baals, and they shall be remembered by their name no more. The names of the Baals were the names of the demons and deities, ignorantly used as substitute names for the Almighty's name in many Bible translations. The kingdom of Messiah is viewed as a period when Israel like the taken back harlot wife to a prophet husband, who will have no other option than loyalty, 
as the prophet instructed, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be to you. Isaiah 3 verse 3. Isaiah's marriage to an unfaithful wife is a lesson in fidelity and in obedience to the Holy One. Taking a lifelong spouse, making a covenant, is an act of faith and commitment, not only to the partner, the family and society, but most importantly, to the Almighty, said the pastor. Marriage can be seen as a primary exam for believers. Testing obedience in the same way that Uzziah's marriage to Harlot served as an example to ancient Israel. The prophet loved her in obedience and in disregard for his own feelings. To love one's spouse, to stay mutually faithful regardless of how time and the trials of life would treat the couple, is what the covenant expects, he continued. We dare not neglect the covenant aspect of the wedding. Let me give an example of how important any covenant in the name of God is. The pastor continued in dead seriousness. The Gibeonites, a tribe due for the ban, by craft secured a covenant from Joshua and the leaders of ancient Israel. Almost 300 years later, King David had to take the most terrible action of restoration by hanging seven of King Saul's family members because he, King Saul, broke the Gibeonite covenant. That is how sacred a covenant is and why we view the marriage contract as holy. Joshua 9 and 2 Samuel 21. From us is expected an attitude similar of that of Abigail, whose response to David's marriage proposal was that she volunteered her service even to wash the feet of the servants of my master. So should every marriage serve as an example for our children and grandchildren, he continued, quoting from 1 Samuel 25. The option or the need for divorce does not exist, not amongst us, he said, especially not now that Satan is bound, and especially not among us who are called to be part of the new holy nation. Amen, we agreed, for it's indeed unthinkable that one would risk to break vows and oppose the Holy One's expressed opinion. And yet, it often happened in the past that believers started to love the things of the world and lost the way. Our attitude to marriage differs much from the world and also progressive Christianity, when many mixed and matched worldly philosophies with the word, claiming a changed context regarding the sexuality of mankind. A world trying to live with the ramification of atheism at the confluence of pain as a famous but sadly disgraced apologist Rafi Zachariah used to say, it was like the difference between the sage of Shammai, who held that adultery was the only ground for divorce, and the liberal Hillel, who said that any reason would do. Man's ability to find excuses is not new, but Messiah, as our highest authority, defined adultery to include lust apart from adultery, and because God divorced himself from wicked Israel, abuse at the hands of a wicked spouse is accepted as fair grounds for ending the misery by walking out of an evil situation. But for us who are called to be members of a holy priestly nation and who believe in the literal plain reading of the word, Yeshua's verdict on the matter closed the debate, Mark 10. The prophet Uzziah's relationship with his unfaithful wife was thus his strongest sermon. If the people and nations around us do not see the love of Yeshua in us, they will not see it anywhere. The most perfect example of love was on display when God gave his son as the lamb at Passover in Jerusalem. John 1, 29-36 we understand that man must love his wife and that they shall be one in a perpetual covenant. 
we are to be one in mind and one in spirit and to do that this is the message from genesis 2 to the end of the bible similarly our marriages are examples of the ultimate consumption between the bride and our king the pastor exclaimed running out of breath in his excitement with cries of amen and hallelujah not allowing the translator to keep up let us rejoice and be glad for the marriage of the lamb is coming and his wife is making herself ready the pastor then pointed to the cantor who sang in english and hebrew blessed are those who've been called to the marriage supper of the lamb revelation 19 verse 9. next the pastor asked the musicians to lead us in singing the old Jewish wedding song based on Psalm 128. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine and your sons will be like olive shoots around your table. It was followed by the hugely popular and they have returned, echoing the famous words of Ezra 2 verse 1. We loved every word and sang with great joy while we looked past the beautiful couple, past the lovely gardens towards the hazy, brilliant blue of beautiful Yam Chayim. Tears of joy rolled down the cheeks of many. It was truly a Blossom Hill experience, an Ezra three day. The pastor then returned to the nuptials and it was time for the vows and exchange of rings. After completing this part of the formalities, the couple recited the old Jewish prayer. Be sanctified to me with this ring, according to the laws of the Almighty. The couple was then offered a glass of wine by the pastor and he recited the traditional Mi Adir prayer asking Elohim's blessing on the couple before moving on to a small table to sign the ketuvah, the marriage contract. The Korean guests sang a song of blessing as we made our way to the outside and waited on the newlyweds, pelting them with flower petals when they walked to the nearby marquee tent for the reception. After a short break for a few official photographs, the festivity started with a series of short speeches, lots of laughter and shouts of Mazel Tov. We ate and laughed a lot and even danced once before excusing ourselves for a sunset boat cruise. That then, Hosea's marriage is the penultimate video. Next, we'll finish with cruising on the Eliyahu. I hope you find this inspiring. Please share it with your friends and think of those days which we believe will come. Shalom.